All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, and thank you for coming to today's special event. My name is Adam Sylvia. I work in the prints and photographs division here at the library. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce a dear friend of the Library of Congress, Dr. Ben Schneiderman, who is right over here up in front. Today, Ben is going to discuss the extraordinary life of his uncle, photographer David Shim Seymour. Um, and first, I'm going to give a little background on Ben, although he asked me to keep it brief on himself. Um, the focus really here is going to be uh, Shim here today. Um, but Ben is a highly esteemed computer scientist. He was distinguished university professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Maryland College Park and was the founding director of the Human C Computer Interaction Laboratory. He has authored multiple books on computer science and information visualization and has received numerous fellowships, awards, and accolades over the course of his career. Dr. Schneiderman's relationship with the Library of Congress stretches back decades. Um, so it, it was in the 1990s um, that he engineered touchscreen computer terminals here in our main reading room of the Library of Congress. Since then, Ben has become a generous supporter of the library's photography collections. In 2013, he donated 236 photographs by David Shim Seymour to the library. So Seymour, or Shim as he preferred, is among the finest photographers in the history of photojournalism, having documented the Spanish Civil War, the French Popular Front, and the children of Europe orphaned by World War II. A co-founder of the prestigious photojournalism cooperative, Magnum Photos, Shim documented culture and daily life in Italy, Vatican City, and Greece. He also photographed Hollywood celebrities, the nation of Israel, and the Second Arab-Israeli War. So the Library of Congress, the Prince and Photographs Division, we are home to over 10 million photojournalism images. We're one of the largest and um, most developed photojournalism collections in the world. I can say um, Shim's collection here at the library is really the crown jewel of our international photojournalism collections. Um, and so this collection has received a wide interest, not only from researchers working on the subject of photojournalism, but it is also important to the community here in Washington, D.C., which is the home to many U.S. embassies, um, embassies from around the world. We have hosted events for Embassy of Israel, um, Italy, Spain, and Shim's photographs have always been a centerpiece and have really made um, people feel at home here at the library. Um, I will also say that the library preserves numerous collections by Magnum photographers like Burt Guzzle, Bob Adelman, and many others. Shim was really um, one of the sparks that got Magnum going. And if you look at today's photojournalism in industry, so many photojournalists today that work here, that work with the library, are freelance photojournalists. And it was really Shim, Robert Kappa, Henri Cartier-Bresson that really paved the way and created a path for those photo photojournalists to be successful today. Um, so I'll also say that earlier this year, Dr. Schneiderman greatly expanded the David Shim Seymour collection here at the library. He donated an additional 570 photographs along with Shim's papers and press passes. And so with that, I invite Ben to the podium. Thank you, Adam, for that very kind introduction. Um, thank you all for coming here today. It's uh, really a pleasure, and I look forward to a nice discussion and your questions along the way. So I'm very pleased and honored to um, be the nephew of David Seymour Shim, and Adam very nicely described my relationship with the Library of Congress and my donation of, of his prints, Shim's prints, to here. I also spent a year sabbatical 
from the University of Maryland working for James Billington in setting up the uh, website for Library of Congress in 1996 when things were going, the American memory and other parts of that. So that was a great experience for me. Billington was a remarkable figure, and as I came up through the cafeteria, I remembered my delightful lunches with him in talking about what we were trying to do. I didn't know much about his world of Russian scholarship, but he was very savvy about technology and the way it affected people and the way it could be used to expand the role of the Library of Congress. But today, the topic is Shim, my uncle, um, and that's the classic portrait by another Magnum photographer, Elliot Erwitt, who uh, you know, shows the debonair, well-dressed, uh, my uncle, with a you know jacket and a sweater. He was well established in European cultural circles. He knew where to go for lunch and knew how to get the drinks he wanted and knew to stay at the Hotel Danieli in, Vien in Venice and where to go in Rome and what to do in Paris, etc. So uh, he was an interesting, a gentle figure, sometimes called an owl or a chess player, as opposed to his buddies, Robert Kappa, who was much more this dynamic character that is, makes for colorful stories. But my uncle was the sort of bedrock that led to Magnum's uh, success story. So the family originally comes from Warsaw, and he was born in 1911. And they, my, Shim and my mother, they were the only two. Uh, they were brother and sister, came to Paris in the early 30s when that was the place to be. And so that's the picture presumably taken by my father, who's the portrait on the right of my mother and father, a rather happy smile. My father was a difficult man, but here was a nice happy smile, and that picture is one of my favorites of their young life together when they got married and, and came to Paris to join the, 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 the action of where uh, intellectual um, movements were going. These are other pictures by Shim. Of my, um, of my mother, and the one on the left is the only picture that we have where he signed the photo for my mother. And uh, in general, he was a photojournalist, not an artist, and didn't sign pictures. And we'll take a look at his photography, and you can see what things were like. So he came to Paris as a student, um, and he then picked up a camera and went to work and started photographing Paris in the 30s. It was an exciting time of protests and rallies, of social movements. Uh, here you see the, the raised fist of the Front Populaire, and just your visual literacy is that that's very different from the Nazi raised fist. And so you have to understand when you see the pictures what you're looking at. And then picture on the upper right is of protesters chanting uh, during a rally or during a parade. And a very similar picture by Willie Ronis, so almost the same time and moment, is a famous pairing of these two photos. On the lower right, you see the peace movements, disarmament. This is written in English, but these are French uh, protesters. He went to Spain in 1936 several times with my parents as journalists. My parents were journalists and photographed the war. So he became a war photographer, not his style, but that's what he picked up. And you can see he was close to the action as well. And so that was, that was the story. But his main focus was the civilians and the impact on the, on the population and how people lived. And so his pictures through France and through Spain of the tuna fishermen and the miners and the butchers are the things. The nobility of labor was the theme that was portrayed as very much part of the socialist movement of, of those times. In Spain, he took this photograph, which became one of the most famous ones. Time magazine listed it in its 100 most important photos of the 20th century. And that's the photo that we had. It was erroneously identified as during a bombing raid, this woman looking up anguished. But it was a labor movement rally. And the, the tie-in to that was a kind of fake journalism, because it was put on the front cover of a magazine with a picture of a German Luftwaffe bomber above suggesting bombing. But no, it was a rally. Now, that was all we had. We had this image, but we didn't have the negative. And the famous story of the Mexican suitcase, which we'll come to, was in 1938, Shim and his buddy, Bob Kappa, packed up 5,000 of their photos, as well as the work, the negatives. Gerda Taro gave them 
two cardboard boxes, but it became known as the Mexican suitcase because he gave it to the Mexican consular, I think, who took it across to Mexico, where it disappeared for 70 years. And in spite of efforts to find it, it was elusive. Finally, it did arrive, and I'm signatory for the agreement to bring it back to New York, to the International Center of Photography, um, where the 5,000 photos were carefully unrolled and scanned, and there's a whole book with each of those photos in there. Once we got those negatives, now we could see the whole picture. And so you see the way imagery and stories are shaped. The one on the left shows the heroic individual, the woman nursing in the face of trauma. The one on the right shows the socialist masses gathered together for a, a, a labor rally. And so that's kind of the way things go. But how, over the years, for me, the constant satisfaction, pleasure, and fun of getting a call that says, hey, Ben, we found this. <laughs> and now we get back those images uh, in those 5,000 photos. And when those photos appeared in New York, it was the full front page of the Sunday New York Times Arts and Leisure section to tell the story. It was that big a story about the recovery of these 5,000 images by Shim, Robert Kappa, and Gerda Taro. Shim came to New York, or came to the U, well, came to Mexico first in 1940, and then by train came to New York, uh, and then came to H Hagerstown, Maryland, where he was one of the Ritchie boys. About 14,000 were recruited, mainly Europeans, because they spoke the languages, and so they were to be intelligence officers, and so Shim was into the Army, and you see him here with his Master Sergeant um, arm piece. And here he gives his, uh, his photograph, the back of the photograph says, To Lucy, a Ride to the Future, Shim, 1944. And he was then sent to the uh, Air Force Base in England in Mendenham, Mend, yeah, Mend, Mend Menham, uh, UK, and worked as a photo interpreter. Um, and so that was an important role for him. He worked on the interpretation of the, uh, of the Brittany beaches, part of the um, Allies' efforts to distract the Germans to the Normandy invasion. Uh, so he felt a little, a little bit, but he was out, left out of it, but he was part of that war effort. After the war, he picks up his camera again, and with his buddies, Robert Kappa and Henri Cartier-Bresson, comes to form Magnum Photos in 1947, which remains, as Adam said, a leading group of that. Now 80 photographers, 60 staff, and 20 estates of which I represent Shim's work. And so that's a continuing story for me and my satisfaction from my world of computer science. About a day a week I spend on what's happening in the world of Shim and the fascinations of new discoveries or the ways his work is put to, to use as covers of books for posters for exhibits, and we'll see some of that in a while. In 1948, Shim was sent um, by UNESCO to travel through six European countries to photograph the orphans of war. Carol Nagar, who's sitting here in the front row, uh, wrote a book about this episode. It's maybe one of the most famous parts or stories of, of his work. He took 260 rolls of film, Carol, uh, of which UNESCO chose 50 photos for this booklet, uh, which is quite a famous one. And if you can get a copy of this, it's worth, it's a real collector's item at this point. Um, and so it included photos here, and we're going to take a look at them because it's one of the famous stories and it characterizes so much of Shim's style of humanist photography and his concern for children and his empathy to the children. So this was the important project, and you have these sort of cute pictures and the troubling pictures of these girls in rather ragged clothes with a, a doll whose head has been torn off. And that's what they have. Uh, and Shim was able to get close to these kids. Uh, this one may be the most startling one. All these boys at an orphanage, and they're all looking at him. They're not smiling, but he somehow managed to get their attention and get them to look at him and connect with them. 
And that you, if you look at his pictures, the way to look at him is think, what happened in the 30 seconds before the picture was taken? Did Shim come up, show them his Leica, ask for their permission, show them what he was doing, and gain their participation in taking that photograph? And so Shim's empathy was really the key to his success, not just with children, but we'll see later with Hollywood stars and politicians and so on. And while Robert Kappa gets the title of the greatest war photographer and is famous for the line, if your photos aren't good enough, you're not close enough. But I would say for Shim, if your photos aren't good enough, they're not close enough emotionally. And so Shim's style, as Adam suggested, was influential to many other photographers. I would say most strongly Susan Mizellis and Mary Ellen Mark of the magnum frame of mind, but others maybe as well. So you see from these photos what uh, Shim was trying to do to show the stories of these kids. And I just might say before we come to this one um, that this booklet and Shim's photographs are given credit for advancing the acceptance of the Marshall Plan, the U.S. plan to rebuild the uh, European countries, even to contribute to Germany. This sympathetic image in the times well before social media uh, and television um, were really central to giving people that emotional connection to what it is. And Shim and his buddies believed that a photo could change the world. And sometimes they succeeded. Okay, So here's the one that changed the world. Famous picture of Tereshka, shown in this troubled-looking young girl in Poland, often again mischaracterized as a survivor of Holocaust concentration camps, but no, she was a Polish child. And it's used in dozens of books on children at war, orphans, cultures under siege, collective violence and trauma. So for me, it's this kind of satisfaction that it became this iconic image that told the story and gave you the empathy. She was asked to draw her home, and all she could get was this scrawl of photos, of, of uh, chalk. Her name is on the upper uh, part of that board. Uh, it says Tereshka, but that's all she could manage. Two stories that come from that that I'll tell you of the many. I get a contact from a German philanthropist who says, I would like to use your uncle's photo of Tereshka to represent my foundation, which I call the Tereshka Foundation. For his initial effort was the children of war in Rwanda. Well, I was touched by this. I made a nice contact with him, and I said, of course you can use this photo. And so the Tereshka Foundation is still out there doing its good deeds, and that gives me the kind of pleasure and tells you again something about the power of an image and power of photography. On the right, you see Carol's book, her story of Tereshka and her photographer, a bit of a novel, a bit of an imagination to think based on facts, but it was Carol's poetic and creative side that she let loose to try to imagine what happened before, during, and after this relationship. And what you can see is the cover is not the girl, but the scrawl on the blackboard representing the trauma and the trouble of that, of that child. Very effective. So you might want to take a look at her book, of Tereshka and her photographer. This story, I mean, it still keeps alive. Washington Post in 2019 reports Sebastian Smee, um, should have invited him here, but uh, he reports on the Boston Museum of uh, Fine Arts, and they took the donation of another version of that, another image on that contact sheet of Shim's work uh, with Tereshka, um, which he donated to the, um, to the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. And so the story continues. Uh, you can take a look at your own time, Shim's Children of Europe. There are a couple of videos, one produced by Carol um, and others, which tell the story of 
of Shim and the Children of Europe, or Carroll's book, The Children of War. Shim continued to work. I mean, his, his work life was rather a short one. It was before the war in Paris and Spain. After the war, he begins in Europe, and he you know, works for American newspapers like This Week magazine, we'll see, a, which was sort of a leading magazine, a Sunday supplement in many newspapers. And he's traveling around here, an Italian passport. On the side, you can see his American passport. I, while Adam was setting it up, I uh, opened it up, unfolded the pages. They're all filled. You could write a whole book, a novel, a story, a history just on 1947 to whatever it was, 53 in that, uh, in that passport. Uh, just all the stamps and the colorful stories there of where he went is just packed. He was, great, uh, he was greatly attracted to Israel, and its early days of founding were uh, a wonderful story of hopeful, of rebirth, of rebuilding. And this one on the left, this sort of determined look of this young woman with a rifle over her shoulder heading out for sentry duty in one of the kibbutzes. So that's kind of, that was the image. But the one on the right is a proud father holding up child, the first child in an Italian kibbutz of the first child born here, the proud father there among it. And that became very iconic. It was even a corporate advertising piece of proud for their new products. Uh, but here it shows it. And in 1996, the BBC tracked down the father and the, and the child to do a story about them. So that was, that's one of my favorites is kind of the smile on the father, again, captures the great feeling of uh, of enthusiasm that Shim was so good. His pictures are not, necess are not only about the image, but it's about the emotions. So when you think of it, you think about the, the emotional content. Marshall McLuhan told us that photographs were tactile, which was a tough thing to follow, but they're also emotional stories, they're stories. And Shim was the creator, of, with others, of the idea of a photographic story, Life magazine, became the conveyor of those kind of stories. Not an image, but seven or 10 images or 15 with a story that went along with it. This is one another of my favorites in Israel, uh, a wedding. Um, and the traditional chuppah over the young couple is held up in this case by a pitchfork and a gun. Okay, And you can see the rabbis just in front, and the people have gathered around. This, this picture is. Is really almost too good to be true, so troubling that several people have written that they didn't believe, they believed this was a staged photo. They didn't believe that it would, could be set up. And it, it entered the controversy like Robert Kappa's Fallen Soldier, where the soldier's falling back, dying, and apparently been hit with a bullet in the head. And that was also suggested to be staged. I don't think these guys staged photos like that. I think they were after the real story, and I think that's what you're seeing here, the real story of what happened. Shim was also good at connecting with the personalities. Um, Tuscanini on the upper left with the death masks of Verdi and I think Brahms, if I remember. Bernard Berenson uh, on the lower left, a classic photo that you'll see became the cover of many uh, version, many books about Shim, and Picasso underneath. Now here again, my fun story. I gave a talk about Shim in uh, my new home in Vancouver at the University of British Columbia earlier this year, and um, I get an email from three art history professors who say, we have a story to tell you, and they send me the draft of their academic paper about this photo and about Picasso. And they believed, I should have put it close here, but they believed that Picasso saw this photo in the magazines in Paris at the time. And look at that photo. And look over here at Picasso. Here we are. And that woman looking skyward these three art historians built the case. They studied the days in which Picasso created Guernica. And there are two such images on this a large 
30 or 40 foot wide photograph that have a woman facing the sky in anguish. Their argument was that, she, that Picasso saw this and he was inspired to use that as a basis for his painting. And when, when Shim went to photograph him, he said, come over here. I want you to pose behind this one. <laughs> and so this is for an art historian. It's a great story about how photography influences art, and then art influences photography. Carol questions the veracity of that story. <laughs> Yes. Uh, in Seven or I think, Paris, yeah. Right? And that, uh, in Paris, in Paris. Paris. And on that occasion, pictures by, uh, by Shim and by Papa were enlarged. Okay. A monumental uh, size. Okay. And they were seated by, so. by the pictorial service on the floor of their kitchen <laughs> in pieces because they didn't have a large bed. <laughs> Great. So Carol's telling us that this. Fo this fi picture was taken at the Spanish Pavilion in Paris in 1937, and that Shim and Kappa's works were displayed there as well. So there is this interesting story about this interplay among characters here, but this picture is maybe one of the more popular ones. For those people who are interested in having a Shim print, who have trouble with the, the trauma of children or war, this picture represents a very positive image of creativity and, and Picasso in a determined way looking into the camera in front of you know, a part of his, his, his ma masterpiece, Guernica. Growing up as a child, Guernica was in New York City and you know, we're in the Museum of Modern Art where I live, but it's in the Prado. You have to go to Madrid now. So that's it. Any comments about this or questions? I'll take a little breath. <laughs> yes, thank you. Fair question. I don't know, but I, I, you know, there's some places you can see. He did. But in general, I would say no. He was quite into the naturalistic, you know, settings and didn't want to interfere with what was happening. The question, sorry, the question was, was it natural for Shim to lead people into pos certain positions? And I'm saying, I don't know, but um, I would say in general, he tried to get people doing what they were doing, naturalistic, ethnographic. Marshall Presser. Yes. Yes, that's right. So Marshall's saying, didn't Shim pose the Berenson picture? And Carol says. So Carol's saying that he followed Berenson. So Carol's putting her, her weighing in on the side that says naturalistic, not taking, not pose. There's, there's lots of things to say. If you look in the, on the left of that picture, it's a little small here, but you see a window, OK? And you see it's kind of shaded. Now, if you look at the prints made, you'll find most of those prints, that window is bright white and all burnt, you know, all, all, all very contrasty. This photo, which is a later version, was made from the same negative, but the printer told me they spent four hours to burn that in to get a darker window so as to not distract from the gaze that Berenson had for the stone maiden uh, in front of him. Barrett Carroll says he was almost blind at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's it's you'll see that picture later. Another great story. Peggy Guggenheim, a real character. Uh, I was in Venice a year ago and went back to the Guggenheim Museum and refreshed myself on her colorful story. Her father was Benjamin Guggenheim. Dies on the on the Titanic. She gets an inheritance and begins to buy in the 30s and uh, early and uh, she buys art of Chicago and, and, and 
um, and Picasso and others at the time, okay? So this is a famous picture of her with her dogs. Uh, it's a sort of smiley picture. There's a rather dour version of this picture. And you can see this is a square. It's not the Leica, but it's the th six by six inch negative of the Rolleiflex. And uh, this is widely used by the Guggenheim Foundation, the Guggenheim Museum and others. Uh, so that's very nice. Um, and I get a call one day from Diane at Magnum in New York, and she says, Hi, Ben. Uh, we need your help. Um, there's going to be a Broadway play all about Peggy Guggenheim, and they want to use your uncle's photo for, you know, their publicity. It'll be on all the, the buses and the bus stops all around the city. I said, great. That's wonderful. Why are you calling me? And she said, well, we have a little problem. Um, needs your permission here. Magnum is very strict, no cropping, no, f no fixing. He said, they want to colorize it. And there was an artist whose work I followed, I liked John Ritter at the time, and they said they want to color it. And I laughed and I said, okay, <laughs> uh, I could go along with that, but make sure that they include you know, a definite caption and identification. I said, great. And she said, we're not done. <laughs> she said, they want to substitute the face of the actress Mercedes Rule for Peggy Guggenheim. <laughs> I laughed again. <laughs> I said, wow. I said, that's pretty different from what you usually get. She says, yeah, it sure is. Um, <laughs> so that was kind of a challenge. But I, I, I like these things. I like the way my uncle's work gets reinterpreted. And so that's what they did. <laughs> <laughs> they lifted the side glasses, they put Mercedes um, uh, rule face in front, uh, and so that was where they were going. But I, f in the end of the phone call with Diane, I said, you know, I have a request too. Four tickets for opening night. <laughs> so I went, and there I am at the, at the theater in front of the poster, a bit of a glare, but that's the story, and uh, it's one of those sweet stories in that photo. Uh, the colorized one is, is frequently shown uh, as, as another version of it. But those are the kind of fun things that I get to deal with. Other nice stories are Sophia Lauren here in the early 50s as a young woman photographed just in this kitchen setting. No Hollywood uh, publicist would allow this kind of photo to be taken uh, these days, but he photographed Sophia Lauren and she sort of invited him and taught him how to take the kind of cheesecake photos that, uh, <laughs> that seem right. And here she is, very attractive and, and you know, again, shim style of connecting with the, the his um, subjects, you can see she's really part of this story. She made this photo as much as Shim did. She knew what to do. She sat up on this little table and posed for him in this very fetching way uh, that gentlemen and women like this too. And notice the sort of negative space between her arm and her very narrow waistline here. So this photo is another gem. Um, but Color photos from that time have degraded in color, so there's been rebalancing efforts. It's not perfect, so the color balance is not quite natural, but hey, that's where we are with these things. Ingrid Bergman was another favorite subject, and you can see on the SHIM website the letter from Ingrid Bergman that says, you make beautiful, I make beautiful babies, you make beautiful photos. And she always invited him to come take pictures of uh, her, her family, and her children. And so there's a lot of very warm feelings. And so there we have this warm relationship and these nice letters. And she writes another letter asking for more prints of these photos that she could send to family and so on. So in contrast with Robert Kappa, who had an affair with Ingrid Bergman, Shim was the kind of good, trusted friend. So that's kind of another part of the relationship. There's Joan Collins and Kirk Douglas, uh, other pictures when Hollywood was making a lot of films in Europe because it was cheaper to do there. So you have uh, many American film stars coming to Europe and Shim photograph them in Europe. We don't have any photographs of Shim photographs in the U.S., but he photographed a lot of American stories that were in Europe. Uh, the Kirk Douglas photo was hanging in exhibit now, what is it, almost 20 years ago at the Corcoran Gallery, when there was a Corcoran Gallery. Um, and and uh, 
the curators from National Portrait Gallery saw this and they came to me and said, we don't have a picture of Kirk Douglas and we don't have a photo by David Seymour. Would you donate? And so that's now in the Portrait Gallery. Audrey Hepburn was another beloved star. These photographs show her in her delightful ways um, in making the film Funny Face in 1955 in Paris. Uh, Shim's photographs join the many photographs of Audrey Hepburn by Magnum photographers and others. Maria Callas, another famous opera star. I always thought she was Italian or maybe Greek. But last year, I get a request from Magnum that the Portuguese government wants to honor the 100th birthday of Maria Callas by issuing a postage stamp. And they would like to use your uncle's photo on the right <laughs> as the basis for this, you know, this, uh, this um, postage stamp. So I granted, yes, I don't know. I didn't, never got copies of that stamp, but I hope they made that. Um, Gina Lola Brigida, who died a year or two ago. Uh, is here also color rebalanced, not quite right. And Marilyn Monroe, and he didn't take pictures of Marilyn, but there they were at the 21 Club in New York. So that's kind of the world he traveled in, which was quite fun and glamorous. And among the glamour is this young boy who is me <laughs> in New York with my mother and sister on West 93rd Street, which was home to us. And Shim took these photos uh, at the Joan of Arc statue, if you know that one, on West 93rd Street and Riverside Drive. And the end of the story begins, well, of his sad day of his going to Suez in 1956 to Port Said to photograph the, the 56 crisis, the Suez crisis that became known. And here we have a couple of pictures. Um, this one elegantly composed, uh, but this was also a drama where you see the Egyptian tank on the, in the back. And I get an email from an Egyptian historian who says, I would like to use your uncle's photos because this photograph um, in a book that he's writing, this photograph includes a picture of my brother who was killed in that war. Of course, I say yes. And he says, your uncle was a wonderful man. He was a wonderful, he was a man of peace. He understood the suffering of the Israelis and the suffering of the Egyptian people. And he was a man of peace. Sort of have chills and telling the story still. And he closes saying how tragic that he was killed by British gunfire when we understood that he was killed by Egyptian gunfire. Well, my sister and I were kind of shattered by this uh, because, you know, the, this, the death was an international, my, my uncle's death in 56 was an international story, which as a child I remember. My, I remember my mother crying and that she heard about this in the morning news. And so it sort of remained its story and it was told as Egyptian gunfire. So this Egyptian historian says the Egyptians would never have fired. The British fired first and asked questions afterwards. Well, I put him in touch with Carol. Carol is Egyptian. And they had a long exchange. And we were a bit puzzled and we didn't know. But a few months later, I get an email from the guy on the right who is a British paratrooper in his foxhole. And he says, I have your uncle's last photograph. Your uncle drove by our foxhole in a Jeep with Jean Roy from Paris Match magazine, another photographer, and asked for directions. And I took out my camera, gave it to your uncle, and he took this photograph of us in this foxhole. Well, I said, that's pretty amazing. I said, what do you think? Was my uncle killed by British? or Egyptian gunfire. He says, let me check. So he sends email to his British buddies, and a few weeks later comes back, and he, they say, no. They heard the firing. They heard the gunshots, but it wasn't them. Sometime later, a, 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 a journalist from Le Monde tracked down the Egyptian gunman who killed my uncle. And there's a story written by this that's kind of hard for me to read, but it's on the website. You can take a look. I, you know, I find it's just a very brutal description of his death and many bullets in his body. And yes, so 
So that's kind of the end story. And here you see both my uncle and Jean Roy in a field funeral ceremony with a rabbi, American, uh, American uh, army rabbi, and Jean Roy on the casket with a French flag on top of his. And so that's kind of the sad end of the story. Um, but it's only the beginning of the legacy part of this, this talk. So my uncle took many other pictures, a whole book. He was fascinated by the religious groups in, in Italy and elsewhere and spent a lot of time photographing Italy, uh, the Vatican. He loved Rome and stayed in the Hotel Inglaterra, which I visited various times. Yeah, so, and, and this book's a famous one. Uh, that's, uh, that's quite a beautiful story, and it's, you know, the photographs of David Seymour. And the 2023 donation to the Library of Congress, Adam chose a large number of photos that were from the Vatican, and Adam's written a very thoughtful blog post on the Library of Congress website about the Vatican photos and that history. Why is it in color? Is it? I don't know. I don't know. It, was, it, it would have been difficult to colorize at that time, so I don't know. It may have been early. Or maybe, it maybe, was an maybe, early maybe it was an early color. Uh, be, be, began to shoot color. We'll see more of that in a little while. This early book from Paragraphic is from one of those Italian festivals, a snake festival, and these two children playing very <laughs> relaxedly with this snake. And there's other pictures with hundreds of snakes and kids playing with snakes. Here we see the two covers, a key book, Inga Bondi, who worked with Shim at Magnum, uh, wrote a wonderful coffee table book, uh, also become quite a collector's item um, that shows. And if you look, you can see both of these have the poorly printed image where the, the window light is all bright and you don't see the, the, the texture in the window. Uh, but these, uh, the second book, Tom Beck, I was hoping Tom might join today. Tom is curator at University of Maryland, Baltimore County. He's retired now, but they have two or three million photos, including a good bunch of shim photos. And he wrote a very thoughtful book. This one's a larger production. You can get these online. It was Faden Press, had a large press run. And it's 55 prints, but look at the prints, which are nicely done, but read his captions. Tom Beck's captions are really thoughtful of capturing the historical moment, the context, and, and, and really getting at the story side of it. Cynthia, uh, Cynthia, young. yeah, Young, I'm sorry, at ICP, curated uh, the exhibit on the Mexican suitcase in 2011. And that exhibit, you can still see that online. You can see her books. And then uh, exhibit uh, in 2013, a retrospective of Shims. Uh, and this one is the famous uh, picture on the Normandy beach. Again, children playing in the aftermath of World War II in the wreck of whatever, you know, uh, uh, in, in gun emplacements uh, on, on the Normandy beach. There are many other books um, on Shim. Carol's is here in the middle. Um, Carol also wrote French versions uh, of the book La Vie de Shim, and they're Italian. And uh, the did not stop at Eboli. Eboli is uh, another story. I'll just cruise a little bit ahead to leave time for further questions. It was a very nicely done exhibit in Tel Aviv um, in March 2017. My sister and I both spoke at the opening there. And the exhibit was a really wonderful curatorial success story um, where the curator here seen with my sister. Uh, he and I went to Magnum Photos in New York, and Matt Murphy, the superstar curator there, um, we asked him, you know, to bring out shim photos, and he said, wait a minute, let me look in the color slides, and he comes back excitedly with two large sheets of Kodachrome images that no one had ever seen before of color images uh, in Israel. So this was a big deal for an exhibit in Israel. And you can see they made these huge blow-ups of the color images uh, of, of the scenes we had known uh, in black and white. But there they were in color, giving new life uh, to those photos. Um, the 
Cynthia Young exhibit travels to Amsterdam, and daughter Sarah picks up, and she attends the opening and speaks there. So this becomes a family project to tell the story of Shim. The mayor of Paris puts up a plaque to celebrate dans ce, uh, cette mobile, in this building, 1937 to 39, Kappa, Taro, and, Sh and David Seymour Shim worked, okay? And so pioneers of photojournalism, of war, celebrated for their images and the Front Populaire and the Spanish Civil War. So you can go to Paris and see that plaque, but that's the kind of sweet recognitions. Carol attended there uh, and Cynthia also was there, right. Um, I, I like to recommend that I contacted Mark Levitch to see if he'd come here today, but he was busy. Um, but the National Gallery of Art, to which I donated uh, photos through the good works of Sarah Greeno, I don't think Sarah's here, uh, but they have shim photography too. And Mark wrote a wonderful, really great essay that tells the historically situated um, issues about shim and his work. Uh, and describes him in his very much humanist photography. Um, well, I don't think I had it here, but uh, Michael Kimmelman, the New York Times uh, uh, arts critic, wrote a beautiful essay. It's one of my favorite of uh, when the 1996 exhibit was on. So there are exhibits now, if you tell your friends in Chicago, till November 26th. It's been on for a year, but there's a shim exhibit of 51 prints there. Uh, and uh, that will travel next year, I think I can say it, to Portland, Oregon, uh, so there'll be other uh, that will reappear. And the Toronto Metropolitan University, formerly Ryerson University, is making a exhibit. Paul Roth, who used to be in Washington, is running that now and will have an exhibit about uh, the UNICEF or UNESCO project about the children. So I donated a set of prints and materials about that to Toronto's Metropolitan University. And Carol, the featured story here, Carol's 2022 biography. I just think it has this deeply researched, I learned a lot, um, and, and poetically written, especially a charming opening, the first few pages, which just talk about all the different names that people had for Shim and the way he was beloved by so many people. You'll see on the side there, there's a letter from Robert Kappa, and it says, Dear Shimsky, which was sort of another way. Shim was the derivative of the original family Polish name, Shimin, S-Z-Y-M-I-N, but he shortened it to Shim and took up the name David Seymour. And on his US citizenship papers, it says David Robert Seymour, which you may guess, we don't know, was influenced by his dear friend, Robert Kappa. So, but he was David Seymour or David Robert Seymour. This book is wonderfully written. Um, please take a look. It's a, it's, a great, it's a great contribution to the scholarship and writing about, about my uncle. Um, the website is out there, just simply davidseymour.com. It has lots of photos, lots of text, lots of things to read if you want to dig, uh, a few videos, and so on. And then, of course, we close with the Library of Congress and my great pleasure about the exemplary stewardship that the library uh, has, you know, has provided to provide a home, a permanent one, a trustworthy one, an accessible one. Uh, the resources of the Library of Congress are unmatched, and Adam's been just the good soul in making the connection, and Helena Zinkman, who runs the prints and photos, is, there she is, thank you, Helena, <laughs> um, you know, has been over this, including from 2013 when we first started, and the other curators at the time, uh, Vera, Verna, Curtis. Verna Curtis and Beverly, Bren. So it was really my satisfaction to have these things. But you can see these things online and the additional 500 photos, and there will be more coming, um, will be scanned and eventually become available online. So we have people in the room today who are going to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you for all that. And I close with my thank you for my uncle Sean. <laughs>